Hi, welcome. I'm Catherine Watson, and this is the Life After 50 show, What You Need to Know. I'm really excited today. I'm here with Amanda Fott. She is a pharmacist, and we will be talking today about seniors and medications. We're going to be talking about all the questions you have. So, Please feel free to add any questions below in the comments section. Uh, we do this show every Monday at 11. So every Monday at 11, I'm going to bring you another expert to talk to you about what you need to know. Next week, we will be talking with a medical exercise specialist about arthritis. So that should be a good show. All of the previous shows are able to be accessed. Simply go to the video tab and click on that and you'll see all of the live videos. So you can rewatch and listen to whatever is available. And I am really excited to be here with Amanda because this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, there's so many people out there that um, are struggling with medications or and families that are worrying, is mom taking too many medications? Um, is this one gonna affect this one? What should we be doing? And they just don't know where to turn. There's a lot of other issues. Amanda and I sat down and talked a few weeks ago uh, before doing this program. And there's a lot of other issues that seniors have as well. Uh, so many of them are signing up for the wrong Medicare programs and their medications aren't covered. They just don't know what to do. Um, just a lot of different things. So Amanda, welcome mm -hmm. to the show. We're so Thank glad you. to have you here on the Life After 50 show. And if you're just now joining us, please feel free to put uh, some any questions you may have in the comment section. We'll be glad to try and get to those questions. If we don't get to them during the program, I'm sure Amanda will come in afterwards and answer any questions you may have. Mm -hmm. So Amanda is a doctor of pharmacy. Uh, she obtained her pharmacy degree in 2015, and she has a soft spot for seniors. Um, so she is uh, going on and pursuing her education to get a certification in geriatric pharmacy. Uh, this will enable her to work more closely with your doctors and uh, be able to help the seniors in a, in a better way. So I'm, that sounds really exciting, Amanda. I'm really excited that uh, to even know that there is that specialty. I didn't, didn't realize that. Um, Amanda works for one of the large chain pharmacies here, and um, she consults with seniors on a daily basis. I'm sure they come into your uh, pharmacy quite often, right? Daily, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's just turn it over to you, Amanda, and please um, feel free to talk to us about whatever you feel families and seniors need to know. Okay. So like we talked about what you had just mentioned, a lot of people think that their parents or their loved ones are on too many medications, which is usually the case. They are usually on too many medications. The reason is, is when you become a senior citizen, you're going to multiple different uh, practices, be it uh, like your regular pharma or your regular physician, your, if you had surgery, you have a surgeon, if you have diabetes, you have an endocrinologist. So you have a multitude of different doctors prescribing multi multiple different medications. And a lot of times those medications, they can overlap and they can be on too many medications for the same type of thing. So for example, if they have diabetes, they could be on, um, they could be on metformin, which is our standard, but they could also be on like two different sugar lowering agents. They could be on insulin and they could all be coming from different doctors. And if that's the case and they're reducing the sugars too much, that's very dangerous. So you've got to be very careful when mixing different medications from different doctors. So first things first, the best thing to do is always have a list of your medications with you whenever you go to a different physician. And that includes the strength, the dose, and how frequent you're giving it. Um, the second is make sure you're on the same board with your pharmacist. So your pharmacist, they're there 24 seven for your medical needs. So if you have any questions, you can go to them. 
Now, if you're using multiple pharmacies, it can get difficult for your pharmacist, so it's best to stay at the same pharmacy so they can see all of your medical records in one spot. They can also see all of your doctors that you're going to. They can they can see everything if you're at the same pharmacy. So it's best, I'd say, make a make a trip, meet your pharmacist, get to know them, and make a decision based off which insurance plans you have and which one you think would be best for you. So um, when I'm working with my senior citizen patients, I like to do something that's called MTM, where I can go through all of their medications with them, sit down with them, or even do it over the phone, where they can sit down with all their medications, tell me how they're using it so I can see if they're compliant. I have sometimes I have them count their pills so I can backtrack and say if they're actually taking them or not. Um, I also go through and I see if there's any interactions or any side effects that they might be experiencing. They might they might be alternatives that don't cause those side effects and they're hindering their life. And then I make recommendations to their physicians on a daily basis based off of that information. So your pharmacist is a huge asset to your medical needs and definitely need to go and meet them, talk with them and explain your concerns to them. I, I agree. Um, Amanda, when my, we were taking care of my mother-in-law, she had rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she had dementia. She had multiple things. Like you said, many seniors do have multiple mm -hmm. different health issues going on mm -hmm. and she's going to different doctors for different things. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was really uh, confusing, especially when the dementia started setting in and she started needing some anxiety medication and worrying about that. Do we put her on it? Do we not put her on it? What are the side effects? Talk to me a little bit about some of those medications, if you would, because sure. I think that's a big um, concern for a lot of people who have somebody uh, that maybe has Alzheimer's or dementia and um, and they're at their wits end. They're not sure what to do. OK, so a lot of times your uh, dementia medications, they interact with a ton of other stuff. So, again, you've got to check the interactions with your pharmacist and your physicians. But there's this thing called the beers list and the beers list is kind of like a recommendation guide to um, practitioners to prescribe medications to geriatrics and the risks that are associated. And a lot of our anti-anxiety medications and psychi psychiatric medications are on that. And the reason is, is because they cause somnolence or sleepiness. And when that occurs in your geriatric population, they get confused. They can get dizzy, fall, break a hip. And so it's very, very risky. And you have to be very careful, especially on the anti-anxiety medications that you're prescribing, that they are they have somewhere they can sit or sleep. If they're going to be taking it, they're not going to be up and walking around. And it's not in combination with other things that are also causing somnolence, like Benadryl. Benadryl is a huge one we see. People take it for their allergies. They don't know. They don't think that grandma's going to take it, fall and break a hip. But it's very common. Wow. That's something I, I hadn't really thought about either. Um, but the over-the-counter stuff that people are taking, um, especially geriatrics, um, is probably uh, a lot more caution needs to be taken with somebody over a certain age that has multiple health issues, correct? Exactly. So, like, for example, so if your mother was taking Benadryl just for an allergy, she had a rash or something, and then they gave her an anti-anxiety medication. Well, she's at a much, much higher risk for falling asleep and or getting dizzy and breaking a hip. So it's very important. Good, good, good. So what what else do seniors need to know? Um, I would I would talk to their pharmacist because, like you've mentioned, the med the Medicare plans that they sign up for can restrict them financially based off of which medications they can get. So a doctor can prescribe whatever they want to prescribe, but if the patient can't afford it, they're not going to be able to take it. So it's very important to work with your pharmacist and your doctor, get a formulary from your insurance company and take it with you. The mm -hmm. formulary from your insurance company is going to tell the doctor exactly what the insurance will cover and will not cover. And that way they can prescribe off of that. And it's going to save you so much time and money than if you, we're just to go in blindly, a doctor prescribes you something, go to the pharmacy, find out it's not covered, and then you got to wait a week to potentially get it changed. 
Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I know some of the more expensive medications, for instance, my mother-in-law was on Humira, which is very expensive. Very, um, yes. I think the shots were like $600 a piece. Mm -hmm. It was not cheap. And she couldn't really afford that. Well, she found out that she could go directly to Humira and they actually gave her the medication free. Mm -hmm. As a pharmacist, do you know about these different um, companies that do that? And can, are you allowed to advise oh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, patients that come in that talk to you about their um, concerns with not being able to pay for medication and giving them different alternatives? Oh, absolutely. So most of the times, if it's a brand name medication like Humira, the manufacturer will have discount programs or patient assistance programs that you can go sign up for, and they will help you pay for your medications. Now, if they're on Medicare and say they're on a brand medication, uh, like I had one the other day with Sinjardi, which is a, a diabetes medication. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the discount cards that you can get from the manufacturers do not get you cannot use if you're Medicare eligible. However, they do have patient assistance programs that you can sign up for. It's a little bit different. It takes a little bit more time, but it can happen. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that's uh, another reason why somebody would want to get to know their pharmacist. Exactly. Be honest with them. Let them know, mm -hmm. hey, you know, the doctor's prescribed this medication, but I'm not planning on taking it because I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Let them know that because they might be able to help you. Exactly. Um, so uh, reach out for help. There's a lot of help out there, but people just often don't know where to go or where to start. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, getting with the pharmacist um, can help you to learn about things that you maybe didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot, like a lot of times, like what you mentioned with over the counter, a lot of times a doctor may prescribe something like, uh, clotramazole, which is an antifungal, and say they put it in a cream form because you may have a yeast infection somewhere on the skin. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's not covered on your insurance or you're in your Medicare gap or you have a deductible, it can be really, really expensive just for that one little tube of clotramazole. Mm -hmm. However, if you talk with your pharmacist, a lot of times your pharmacist can recommend something over the counter and come to find out clotramazole is over the counter as a cream. So, mm -hmm. and it's like $6. But you would have never known that because the doctor had handed you a prescription for clotramazole. You went to the pharmacy. They told you it's $200. And now you're, you know, freaking out because you have this expensive medication. But there are alternatives over the counter that are much cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good, mm -hmm. good, good. Mm -hmm. So talk to your pharmacist, everybody. Um, get to know them. Um, I've been a huge proponent of that for a long, long time. Um, because they can really help you. They can guide you in ways that you couldn't imagine and can save you a lot of money at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, exactly. so, you know, uh, that's really important. So let's talk about um, some of the, the inconsistency in care. Okay, so a lot of times what I see, at least in my practice, is say the patient has an acute something whatever happened, a heart attack, a stroke, or a diabetic attack, they end up in the hospital, they get discharged from the hospital, and that discharge paperwork is gonna have all of the medications that they were taking in the hospital, not taking in account all the medications they also have at home. So mm -hmm. patient gets discharged from the hospital with a whole new slew of medications, they go to the pharmacy, get it filled, and now they're on a multitude of the same types of medication as we discussed mm -hmm. previously, working to do the same thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's super important that if you're going to go to the hospital, if it's possible, take the list of medications with you or just take your bag of medicines with you so the admin team knows exactly what you're taking, what you took in the last 12 hours so they know what to give you and discharge you with. Now, if it does happen, again, talk with your pharmacist and they can go through your medications with you and say, well, this is cholesterol medication. This is cholesterol medication. You really only need to be on one. Let's talk with your doctor and find out. Or this is clonidine to reduce your blood pressure. This is nitroglycerin to reduce your blood pressure. Let's talk with your physician to find or your cardiologist to find out which one you need to be on. 
Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So as a pharmacist, you're able to, to look at the medications with somebody if they have concerns about that and make those recommendations, right? Absolutely. We call that a brown bag where the patient brings it. They can bring in all of their medications, over-the-counter herbals, vitamins, prescriptions oh. from other pharmacies, anything. Bring it in a bag, bring it to your pharmacist and say, basically, help me. And that's that's part of the MTM program I was kind of mentioning about where I can go through. I can check every single type of medication coming from different sources and I can check the doses to see like I can I can see the date that it was filled. I can count the pills and see how the patient's actually taking it. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. So if you if somebody wanted to do that, do they need to make an appointment, Amanda? I mean, a lot of times a lot of people do only because pharmacies are super busy throughout the day. And that way we know to expect you and we can give you our undevoted attention. But you don't have to. If you just have a simple question or you're like, hey, I'm taking these five medications. Absolutely go in whenever you want to. It's free. It's there for you. We're there to help you. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. So I know I know when. uh People are discharged when seniors are discharged from the hospital. That's a really critical time. Um, a lot of people, you know, are going back to their home. And like you said, they may be on multiple medications. Um, I know I've talked to some of the home care companies. We had a lady with uh, a home care company on a few weeks ago, and she talked about, you know, how it's helpful if you have somebody that's going to oversee that and help. But that would be an excellent thing for the home care company to do with the senior is to bring those medications in in a brown bag and go with the senior and go through everything. And um, that person could be there to kind of write down uh, what the pharmacist says and the recommendations so that then they can give that to the family if the family is not available to do that with them. I exactly. think that would be an excellent idea. Exactly. So we we just need to learn that we've got to all work together um, with our seniors in this industry uh, to be able to give them the best care possible because nobody wants to see them boomeranging back into the hospital. You know, that's not fun for anybody. It's not fun for the senior. It's not fun for the um, family. Um, it, it's scary, it's frustrating, and hospitals don't like it because they usually get penalized if that happens. So exactly. mm -hmm. it's it's not good for anybody. Um, Amanda, I really thank you for coming on this show. What are we what are we missing here? Is there anything else that we need to talk about? Definitely. You brought it you just put a little thought in my head. The biggest thing that people forget is when they have a senior that they're taking care of, they need to get HIPAA authorization to get a hold of their records. Because if you don't and you come up to the pharmacy asking about mom, I legally, I can't give you any information without that documentation. So you've got to get um, authorization signed, sometimes even notarized. If you go to your pharmacy, you ask for the paperwork. I'm sure the doctor's the same way. They will give it to you. You fill it out, you bring it, and then we're good to go. Otherwise, we are we have our hands tied legally to be able to give any information. Okay. Even if somebody is a power of attorney, they if still they're, if, if there's a power of attorney, that's good. We just need the documentation. But if they okay. don't have power of attorney and they're just there asking questions on mom's behalf, I can't do anything. Right. Your hands are tied. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point to bring up. So, um, yeah, okay. So maybe the home care person wouldn't be the best avenue mm -hmm. unless they wanted to give them HIPAA you know, authorization. Exactly. To that information. Exactly. There are also geriatric care managers out there that can help people with this, and they could go in and talk to the pharmacist on their behalf. But again, you have to have that HIPAA uh, authorization. Mm -hmm. So, Amanda, I can hear your puppy dogs out there. They're frustrated because <laughs> they want to be in on this show, too. I know, I know. <laughs> Man, I tried. <laughs> kids um, uh, that are wanting to be on the show, too. Yeah. So um, one thing I wanted to also talk about, because it's really become a big topic lately, and it's seniors and opioid abuse. Oh, boy, yes. So let's talk about some of those drugs 
why would someone be given these drugs? Why would a senior mm -hmm. um, usually be given these types of drugs? And what should you know about them? And what should families do if mom is prescribed or dad or whoever is prescribed uh, one of these type of medications? Okay. So the biggest thing I see is someone going in for surgery. So they go in for surgery for a hip replacement or a knee replacement or whatever, and they get discharged with hydrocodone, oxycodone, fentanyl, any of, any of that class that's considered an opioid. Mm -hmm. They get discharged with it. They're taking it. Um, if you have a hip replacement, it can be anywhere between two weeks to a month. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then they keep taking it and the doctors keep writing the prescription for it because mom's in pain and, you know, needs help and they keep giving it to her. Well, then we keep seeing the doses go up and up and up. So you could start on tramadol, go to, go to Norco or hydrocodone, and then you need it more. So you go to oxycodone and then it's, you still need more. So then you go to fentanyl and fentanyl is the strongest thing we have right now. The problem is, is as we talked about, uh, with geriatrics is they can become more sleepy very easily or dizzy. And so those medications definitely prone to risk. I mean, I know when I take Norco, it makes me fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Think about if grandma takes it, she's going to fall asleep even harder. And if she's not, so she's at the retirement facility doing activities, that's putting her at risk for hip fracture. Mm -hmm. um, it also is huge because geriatrics, their muscles aren't as elastic as younger people and this type of medication can cause what we call respiratory depression meaning you're going to take this medication you're going to fall asleep and you're not going to wake up because your diaphragm is not working so wow. these this this yeah this population is very very prone to that is what we call opioid overdose where you, I mean, you stop breathing because you've over overdosed so you've got to be very careful on this medication so what the recommendations are now is that no longer than three to seven days on this type of medication. And in fact, at my pharmacy, we're very, very strict. And if you've been on it for more than three months, we have got to get documentation from your doctor as to why, because we're not going to give it to you if you've been on it for more than three months with no reason. So um, definitely look out for tramadol, Norco, oxycodone, fentanyl. Those are the big four that we're seeing. I did not realize tramadol was one of those. My mother-in-law was on that. Yes. Wow. He did yes. have a number of calls. So exactly. Wonder is there a connection there? Oh, yeah, possibly, absolutely. Uh, especially so here in Houston, we have a special cocktail. It's called the Houston cocktail. And if you have an opioid such as tramadol, Norco, oxycodone, or fentanyl prescribed with a muscle relaxer like Soma or Tizanidine or Cyclobenzaprine, along with an anti-anxiety agent such as Xanax or uh, clonazepam or temazepam. That's what we call the Houston cocktail, where you're mixing all these different type of psychotropic medications that are causing them to be sleepy and then never wake up, which is not what you want, obviously. So, wow. mm -hmm. so, so you call it the Houston cocktail. That leads me to believe that it's being prescribed a lot like that. Yes. Very common. Yes. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So this is something that everybody really, really needs to pay attention to. Um, and if you are not sure which medications are at risk, bring that brown bag into your pharmacist and yes. let them look at everything and let them tell you uh, what you should and should not be concerned about and what to do. Um, this is, you know, one of the things, too, I noticed, like, with my mom and my mother-in-law, they were very, very tiny lady. Um, as they got older, they lost a lot of their muscle mass, obviously, mm -hmm. and they lost a lot of weight. And, and they were tiny. They were under 100 pounds, both of them. And um, I have to wonder, uh, are medications going to affect them differently than say a man that weighs maybe 200 pounds. Oh, absolutely. 50 yes. pound person. It's got to oh, yes. them differently, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about when you, when you're dosing a child versus dosing an adult, it's based off of their weight and their body mass, same right. type of thing. And not only that, but geriatrics, they have slower body uh, functions. So like their liver might be slower or their kidneys might be slower, leading them to lower 
excretion rates, meaning the drugs not leaving their body as quickly. And therefore, it's just kind of building up and building up and building up, and they're getting a much higher dose than a normal person normally would. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a question I have, um, somebody asked me this this morning, and so I'm going to point it to you. Uh, does everybody who takes an opioid become addicted? Potentially. So they are addictive source. They are addictive substances. And if you are genetically prone to it, if you're on it for long enough, it restructures the way your brain functions. And it's kind of like the reward system. So you're in pain, you take it, it makes you feel good. You keep taking it. So mm -hmm. really anything, chocolate does the same thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does, it restructures your brain and how it functions. And so if you take it for a long enough amount of time, chances are you will become addicted to it. So that is why these are classified as class two medications, meaning they're the highest addictive substance that we have that also have a medical purpose and that's why we still have them the next thing up would be a class one like cocaine mm -hmm. or heroin right right mm -hmm. so one thing i want to bring up too um, because i was talking to my sister the other day she's 75 and um she has severe arthritis and a doctor uh she was in the hospital a few months back and the doctor gave her a prescription and she asked him, she said, is this an opioid? And he said, oh, absolutely not. And she took it home and she looked it up and it absolutely was an opioid. Mm -hmm. So what I want to point out is your farm, your um, doctor may not always give you the best information or the correct information. So it's important to get another another person, an outside person to give you some answers to. Look exactly. it up yourself, go to your pharmacist, is this an opioid? Exactly. Know what you're taking, you know, yeah. and ask, are there alternatives? What else could we use instead of? So what else could they use instead of say tramadol? Okay. What else would, would they be given? So if it was arthritis, like we talked about before, and they had a knee replacement done a lot, like I said, they would be on a short duration of the opioid therapy just to get them through their surgery and the pain of that. After that, it's usually recommended to be on like an NSAID, which is your naproxen, your ibuprofen, or your aspirin. Usually we recommend ibuprofen, it's at the 800 milligram dose. You can also be on muscle relaxers. They are going to make you a little bit sleepier, but not nearly as much as the opioids. So they're still considered safer. You and can also, right. uh, some of them are, some of them are, okay. but yes. So like Soma is addictive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'd also recommend heat therapy, cold therapy, physical therapy, mm -hmm. all of those types of, um, my Alexa just turned on, <laughs> uh, but all of those types of medications and alternative to medications, you can have acupuncture, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. have just regular walking down the street just to kind of get this stuff working and not being a medical source. Yeah. I apologize. Let me turn my Alexa off. That's okay. Alexa, stop. <laughs> I don't know why she started. Alexa wanted to be in on the conversation. <laughs> well, actually, we are coming to the end of the show. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to uh, join us and to talk about these important topics. So important. So important. Thank you so much. And um, we will be here again live next week. We're going to be talking to somebody about arthritis. And uh, she is a medical exercise specialist um, to uh, teach you some ways to uh, manage your arthritis without medications. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> that sounds like a good program. Thank you again, Amanda. Y'all have a great day. Thank Again, you. it's Catherine Watson, live after 50.